You stand on the shore of the ocean watching the tide come in. You sense the call of the sea beckoning to take you in for a day. You step forward little by little not knowing what to expect. But expecting more. You keep going as the ocean calls. Calls you to enter in to deeper waters. case homicide detective turned Christian apologetics and he's just as serious of the second one as he is of the first one probably even more so and let me tell you a little bit about him like I said he's a cold case homicide detective adjunct professor of projects at Bio University and prosecutor national speaker and author of cold case Christianity God's crime scene which we're talking about today and alive his professional investigative work has been featured repeatedly on Dateline Fox News and Court TV. In fact, at this point, I, I came home one Sunday night from my men's group. My wife said, I think I saw one of your friends on Dateline. Who? Uh, Jay Warner Wallace? Yeah, yeah. His professional investigative work has received national recognition. He's been awarded the Police and Fire Medal of Value, Sustained Superiority Award, and the 2015 California Peace Officers Association Cops West Award for Cold Case Investigation of the Year. Jay Warner also continues to appear as an expert in a number of crime-based television series and is featured in God's Not Dead 2. He's part of a three-generation law enforcement family and has a master's degree in theological studies from Golden Gate Baptist Theological Seminary. So, Jim, you've been on before, but welcome back to the Deeper Waters Podcast. Well, thanks so much for having me, Nick. I'm really glad to be here. Really glad. Well, you're a pretty well-known name of your projects. Your best. Some people might not know who you are. Tell us how you got to be doing what you're doing. Well, kind of by accident, actually. I was um, working as a detective in Los Angeles County. I was not a Christian, uh, and I was really not and had a, had no real desire to even investigate the case for Christianity. The people I knew who were Christians, who I would ask simple questions to, they, they, didn't, they didn't do a great job of kind of defending what they believed, and so I really didn't think there was much there to defend or much there to look at. And certainly, what I what little I did know, it seemed like I could kind of blow holes in in the, the defense that was offered by my Christian friends, but. Uh, at 35, I did um, eventually take a look at the Gospels and just really set out to kind of mine the words of Jesus. I wasn't like Lee Strobel in the sense that I was, um, you know, trying to prove my wife wrong or trying to prove her right. My wife was really not a believer either, so it was not a matter of trying to prove anyone right or wrong. I was just interested in the words of Jesus, maybe as an ancient sage or as the foundation of kind of Western thought. You know, I wanted to kind of see what what all this, this fuss was about, and as I read through the Gospels to kind of mine those words out, I became more and more interested in them as eyewitness accounts. So for me, that the whole journey started as I investigated the Gospels using the same tools that I used uh, as a cold case detective. If you think about it, Nick, there's a lot of similarities. You know, you've got my cases are all very old, 30, 35 years old. The, the people who are being and were interviewed back at 30 years ago, well, they're, a lot of times they're dead. And even the officers who interviewed the original eyewitnesses are now dead. So you're, you're stuck with reports in which both the original eyewitnesses uh, who are reporting this information and the authors who are writing the report are no longer available to you. And you've got to determine, you know, what, what, what can we know on the basis of the, the reports themselves and how do we even begin to examine such reports that's very similar if you think about it to what we do as we examine the uh, you know the gospels and you know we don't, we don't have access to the eyewitnesses we don't have access to the authors but we can use a set of principles that you use in cold case uh, investigations i think to come to a reasonable conclusion so um how long did you do this investigation before you finally bent the knee and said okay jesus your lord <laughs> 
I think for me, it was I, people asked that question, and I, I never, I wasn't keeping track at the time, you know, as, in terms of the first date that I went in the in, entered a church in which the pastor kind of intrigued me to look at the person of Jesus, and then to what point did I? I did I actually, I mean, I think I have a certificate of baptism about a year after the fact, but I think, I would say about six months, um, and, and I was very, very, you know, I spent a couple hours a day before I would go to work just mining through um, the Gospels in different in different uh, uh, translations. I would also do my best, you know, at that, that time I didn't have a degree in theology from Golden Gate, so I had to kind of trust the the kind of literature and the, the resources that were out there related to the original Greek and, mm -hmm. and related to first century sources and just really looked at everything, including a lot of uh, the work of skeptics um, who had written at the time. This is back in like 96, 97. So I was just looking at those sources to see what I could learn, having no idea really who was who in the zoo. I didn't know who was a good scholar, who was a bad scholar. I had to kind of learn from the ground up, and I didn't have a, a faith tradition I was coming from that could really help me. You know, I didn't have anybody I could even ask. I don't have any Christians in my family, mm -hmm. uh, all atheists. Um, so for me, it was just a matter of doing the best I could with the resources I had to, to try to get to the truth of what those original documents contain and then test them for their reliability. Well, while we're here to talk about God's crime scene today, I'd like to ask you a little bit to give kind of like a, a feel for what's coming out. You've you're, you've done some work on God's Not Dead, too, and I know Gary Habermas has also done some work on that. What, what can you tell us about it? Well, the, the movie, you know, the first movie was uh, about a, a student who was confronted in his philosophy class in, in university and kind of asked to, to renounce his faith in God and where that goes from there. And most people who are interested in apologetics are, are at least aware of the movie, right? And a lot of us, when we look at that movie, we're thinking, you know, gosh, I think more most of us as apologists would like to just get to the facts, and can we do a documentary in which we can explain to the church or to the non-believing world why we think this is true, what the evidence is, and I, I understand that impulse, because I have that impulse myself, right? That's why we, we write every day, that's why we make videos every day, and those videos are not uh, fictional narratives, those are basically non-fiction cases for Christianity or cases for theism, and so we do that, but what I've discovered is that if you ask the church, and I travel, and I did 70 events this year, I did 73 events last year, when you're in churches, and you ask churches, are you aware of, of and you mention either any apologist you can think of, from the most famous to the least, or you think of any powerful documentary you've ever seen about the case for Christianity or the case for theism, and if you throw those names out there, and those, those documentaries out there, and you ask the church at large, have you guys ever seen that documentary, or, or do you guys know who that Christian case maker, that apologist is? Here's what you discover: the answer is a resounding uh, no. We're not interested in apologetics. We have no idea what you're talking about, and we've never seen that that documentary. But, but if you ask, how many of you have seen God's Not Dead One, the first movie? Eighty percent of the hands will get raised. Mm -hmm. So, so what we're trying to do here is to move the ball forward with the church, with the big C. By, by doing the one thing that, that I do think the church is interested in, which is a, a, a fictional narrative, right? It's a, it's a movie. And then in that movie, Gary and Lee Strobel and I and Rice Brooks, we try to, to infuse it with some apologetic content because we want to move the church at large a couple of degrees closer to the goal, a couple yeah. of steps closer to the goal, knowing that this is not going to be a documentary in which you're going to be able to cover much we, we want this to be the beginning of, an, of a renewed interest that might then find you watching a documentary. But right now, I'll be honest with you, we've got to get the church to even recognize that there's a need to watch the documentary. And that's what I think these movies do. So when Gary and I were approached at ETS a couple of years ago, you know, we were hesitant, um, but it turned out to be a wonderful experience. And I do hope that in the midst of this, and, you know, we're, we're going to do a, a God's Not Dead, the evidence documentary after the fact. But I can tell you, I, I just know, without even asking, that the, for the millions that will see the movie, a thousand will watch the documentary. Mm. So, so we have to really, I think, start to kind of work our best, to do our best, to infuse what, with the, the one form of movie making that actually reaches the church with the kind of content we can infuse it with, knowing full well 
that we're not going to be able to say, I can't, you know, I can't, my scene is about probably two minutes. And in those two minutes, you, I'm not going to be able to uh, talk about much of what I've written about in the book. And, and Lee's scene is probably even shorter. And Gary's scene is probably even shorter still. So how, how in the world... Five seconds. Yeah, how in the world are we going to, to get content, right? But here's what I do think could happen. I think we could shake the church a little bit and say, hey, do you see now why this is so important yeah. to know this data? And then be waiting in the wings afterwards to introduce them to the broader, larger apologetics community to be able to point people. So my books generally, I consider them to be gateway books. I have a, usually a very large bibliography at the end of each book where I, I provide a number of books that are written by the people who you and I adore in the apologetics community. And, and we are trying to point people to the really the scholars because I'm not a scholar, clearly. Yeah. I'm just a translator. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to use the one uh, career that God gave me that I think that the culture is interested in for some reason in cold case investigations. And so I'm trying to use that one asset I have to introduce the church to the real thinkers who are the source of the evidence that we need to be listening to. Yeah, and Gary had to told me that he to, it took some explain some like convincing for him to go down there as well. And I think he mentioned once that he went to a talk and you were talking on the resurrection using minimal fact explosion, and all of a sudden you're like, "Where's Gary Habermas in the audience?" <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I Gary's one of those guys who is the probably the foremost scholar on the resurrection in the country. So I think people, um, the church, if you ask the church at large. Do you know who Gary Habermas is? Uh, for the most part, they're not, they're not going to know who he is. Well, that's got to change. We, we have to do our best to expose to a genuinely good man who is also a great scholar, who is just a fun guy to be around. Oh, yeah. And, I, and he's a great communicator. It's not as though, you know, Gary's a great translator and, and a scholar. He's kind of the best of both worlds. So I think that those are the kinds of – I was more confident once I saw that Gary was going to be part of this then I could, I could buy in. I could say, okay, I'm, I'm in. Um, you know, and so everyone gets to take a, take a chance here and uh, hope that, and uh, here's what I do see, though, uh, if I'm honest with you, Nick, and you know this too, is that the Christian community is pretty good at eating its own. And so what we'll do is, you know, I know I'm, I'm as picky as, as anybody else out there. You know, I'll, I'll see something and I'll think, man, we, we could have done it a different way. I might have tried to do it a different way. And and we can be really critical of those kinds of efforts, both in apologetics, if someone writes a book in apologetics, you know, it's like if they love you, they hate you, right? And, and so I think what we have to remember, though, is there's a larger goal in mind. And if each one of us can be as selfless as possible and try to point people to everyone else, that's why, for example, on my Twitter feed, you know, about 80 to 85 percent, maybe 90 percent of the stuff on my Twitter feed is not mine. It's the work of other thinkers, other scholars that I'm trying to introduce my audience to. If I've developed an audience, I want them to realize that there's better folks out there and I want to introduce you to them so that you can take a, yet another step. But the, the sad truth is that I do think the church needs an introduction. Yeah. So that one of the best things we can do is introduce, if we have a platform, let's use it to introduce the church to some really good stuff. It's not going to probably be our own. It's going to be like you you're doing, Nick, when you, inter when you interview all the different scholars on your show, yeah. what you're trying to do is to bring the, those scholars to an audience they wouldn't otherwise have. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're trying to do with this uh, with our platform, we're trying to introduce the church to a way of thinking about their faith, which is entirely different than the way they've been thinking about it so far. Well, let's talk about the book, then, God's Crime Scene. Now, you mentioned that a lot of people seem to like these crime scene things and such, and it's true. My wife and I used to watch Elementary together. Yep, great. And yep. For me, the favorite one that I used to watch on these lines was Monk, the yep. obsessive compulsive detective, and my parents always used to say, this guy is just like you, okay? And right, <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. Read all, the, read all the books and such. I always want to try and figure out, can I solve the mystery before Monk can? Sometimes I could. Yeah, <laughs> right. But now yeah, so I think Go ahead. That's, that's the thing we're trying to tap into, I think, here, right? So what we did with God's crime scenes, we said, okay, look, here's the principle. If you know when you walk into a death scene, I do this little trick, and even as I've explained it to other detectives, like the light bulb goes on, they suddenly realize, oh, that's exactly what we do. Because we do it without thinking. 
And then afterwards we go, oh, okay, that, that's right. That's exactly what we do. And so what we do is we walk into death scenes and try to determine if the death scene is a criminal death because you can die by accident, naturally, a heart attack, let's say, or by suicide, and then, of course, you can be murdered. And we want to know, has this guy been mur murdered? Because if he's been murdered, that's a whole different scenario. we got to get busy. we got to find the bad guy. And what we do in order to determine that is we simply ask, can I explain everything in the room as in terms of evidence by staying in the room? If I can, it's probably not going to be a murder. Because if it's a, a headshot, you know, and the victim's laying there and there's a pistol next to him, and, but the pistol is registered to him and it's been in his house for years and it's got his fingerprints and DNA on it and there's no sign of an entry from anybody else. He's the only person I've got any evidence of in the room. Well, then that's going to be probably an accidental or a suicide. On the other hand, if that pistol is, got, is not registered to him and it's got unknown DNA on it, and there's even bloody footprints that are leading out of the room, well, that would change everything. Now, I, I cannot explain the stuff that's in the room by staying in the room. I could before because it was his gun, but if it's not his gun, I have to go outside the room now for the best explanation explanation of the stuff that's inside the room. And when that happens, it changes everything. We now have good reason to believe we have an intruder. We can actually, I think, look outside for that intruder, and that changes this death scene into a crime scene. Well, if we look at eight pieces of evidence in the universe, and we simply ask that question, can I account for these pieces of evidence by staying inside the room? Then and we can ask the same question. And if you cannot account for those things by staying inside the room, you've got to go to the next reasonable inference, which is there's something outside the room of the natural universe that's the best explanation for the stuff that's inside the room of the natural universe. And, of course, this is really the case we would make for the existence of God. So that's what we try to do in this book is to kind of teach some. Every chapter teaches an investigative principle using a real crime scene. Then we turn a corner and try to use it to make the case uh, for this piece of evidence in the room of the universe. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing some <clears throat> readers of the book might wonder, which is something I've wondered, and you answered it on my blog, but let's have an answer here, is that I was looking at it saying, hmm, I see a lot of scientific evidence, but I'm kind of aware of a great philosophical arguments of people like Aquinas and other side history, and for some reason you wanted to avoid those. So what was your thinking going with just scientific arguments instead of so much with philosophical arguments? Okay, so we, it, they're broken in half. I think half the book is, is scientific and half is philosophical. So, for example, the problem of mind, uh, consciousness, free agency, evil, morality, that entire second half is really, it's, it's philosophical. The first half is scientific. So you really are split in half. The eight pieces of evidence, four are scientific and four are philosophical. But I can tell you this, you're right that I didn't begin you know, with arguments for God's existence. So this is not a book where you're going to go to find the classic teleological argument, axiological argument, cosmological argument. You know, you're not going to find those here. Here we're going to take a different, a different way because the problem is about burden of proof. So, you know, who has the burden of proof in a crime scene? It turns out everyone who offers an explanation of the crime scene has the equal burden of proof to show why his or her explanation is the most reasonable. And this takes and levels the field. So if I make a case for God's existence, I have a burden of proof to defend my case. I'm not doing that. I'm simply trying to account for the evidence in the room. Now, as a naturalist, you have a equal burden, whoever that is, who wants to make a case by staying inside the universe, that, fine, do it. Make that the burden's on you, just as the burden's on me. We all have an equal burden. And so what I'm doing is instead of taking the argument down, I'm looking from the evidence up. And this is very common if you look at how we, you know, Cold Case Christianity, my first book, was really about the skill set that you need to evaluate witness statements, suspect statements, because we're looking at the statements of the Gospels. So it's a very suspect or, or witness-centered approach to working a case. And some of my cases are just like that. They are witness-centric. You start with a witness or a suspect, and you work outwards. There are other cases I've worked where you don't have anybody in view yet. If you don't even have any witnesses, all you have is a crime scene with evidence in it. So those cases are crime scene-centric cases. Different skill set. So uh, what we did in the second book was to take the uh, second approach, where we have a crime scene, and we have to make the case with a crime scene-centric uh, case, 
And so we have no witnesses. We can interview for this. We're not testing the reliability of witnesses here. This is very different. So we're just going to look at those pieces of evidence. Some of those pieces of evidence will be examined uh, uh, scientifically. Mm -hmm. Some will be examined philosophically. You also notice that I make no reference to Scripture until the very last chapter. Mm -hmm. That is also uh, intentional because, again, if you're at a, a crime scene centric. Well, that's gonna. There's no witness here. We're not gonna. We're not going to access a witness, including the witness of the Bible, to to make the case. We're gonna take it crime scene centric. We're gonna eliminate eyewitnesses and work it that way. And and in order to do that, of course, uh, it's a little bit different approach. And so some people will say, well, why didn't you kind of lean more into scripture? That's what cold case Christianity does. This is a crime scene centric, which is why we use the title God's crime scene, not to suggest that God committed a crime but to suggest this is the set of tools we're going to use to examine the universe. Well, I can remind everyone, <clears throat> now you're listening to the Deeper Wireless podcast, we've got Jay Warner Wallace on now uh, talking about his book, God's Crime Scene. And before we continue this conversation, I can know that if you're listening this Saturday, and you probably heard this if you were listening last Saturday, show Phil Weeby, we're going to have a guest on who's written a, a, a tiny little bit on the book of Acts. And that, that's going to be Craig Keener. Who apparently the word brevity does not exist in his vocabulary <laughs> because yes if you do not understand the joke we're talking about over a 4,000 page commentary on the book of Acts and no I did not get to read it all before the show started uh, I, I'm not the flash believe it or not but he is going to be here and we're going to be talking about the book of Acts and apologetics now, Jim, I, I like what you said also about the burden of proof, because too often when we get into debates with people, usually the uh, atheists will say, well, you know, the theist, you are the one making the extraordinary claim here, and you have to back it, and many theists will say, well, why don't you just go ahead and prove there is no God? And I agree with you, it's simple thing, is if anyone makes a claim, they have a burden to back that claim. And then also, if they don't back their claim, that doesn't prove the opposite claim. The opposite claim still has to prove their own claim. Yeah, I, I think a lot of this, too, is if you think about uh, the idea of extraordinary, you have an extraordinary claim. Well, we all have an extraordinary claim. I don't care where you are on this issue. If you're going to suggest that you can explain how the universe came into being with using nothing but the stuff that's in the universe, that's going to be a rather extraordinary explanation. If you're going to try to explain why there's the appearance of fine-tuning in this universe, that's going to take some, and this is why it's extraordinary, because no one's been able to do it. And this is one of the demonstrations of its extraordinary nature, the origin of life studies that we see out there. Whatever the ultimate explanation for life, it will not be, and if you think there's a natural, ordinary kind of pedestrian uh, explanation for this, good luck. If that was the case, we would have explained it years ago. Instead, we're, we're still clueless about these things because it, no matter who you are looking at the evidence in the room, it's going to take some kind of extraordinary explanation to account for it. And in the end, I think we're very much in the same boat on this situation. The only question is, which set of forces, uh, impersonal forces or personal forces are the best explanation for the stuff we see in the room. And that's really what divides us. It's not that we, we, uh, my atheist friends still believe that there is an eternal cause of the universe that's impersonal. I'm just suggesting you can't get the universe and the stuff that we see in it with an impersonal eternal cause. We both agree there's an eternal cause. Uh, in, you know, a, 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 an infinitely uh, old cause that has no beginning, but we just disagree about whether that cause is personal or impersonal. And so in the end, we're very close on some issues, but, but what makes the difference is the personal nature of the cause of all of this evidence. It'd be like walking into a crime scene and seeing all the pieces of evidence in the room and suggesting that some set of earthquakes, wind, rain, something like that, drove this evidence into the room in the way I'm seeing it, well, that's a one explanation involving a cause that's natural and impersonal, but I'm making an argument that what we happen to see in this crime scene is the stuff that we see in other crime scenes that is best explained by a personal cause. Well, Jim, I, I, I just have to, you know, be kind of skeptical at this point because, I mean, you say that no one's been able to do it. I mean, hasn't Lawrence Krauss written this book about a universe for nothing and hasn't Stephen Hawking written about the grand design? Haven't they shown that, you know, we we don't need anything 
outside of the universe, such as God, the causes, and the universe would just come about on its own. Well, I can tell you that's, that's something that's very, those are claims that maybe are second level claims in the sense that probably not everyone who's a Christian is even aware of these gentlemen. But if you're in the uh, secular university of one setting or another, certainly if you're at ASU, the Arizona State University, or places like that, you're aware of these teachers who are arguing that they can explain the beginning of the universe by staying inside, or at least by staying inside the room of naturalism in some way. And so I, I, what I tried to do, and as I read the, wrote the book the first time, you know, each chapter, not only, I mean, you have to be able to address the claims made by those who stay inside the room to show that those claims are, they just don't work. So anything that's offered, it fails. But as I was writing the book, I realized, wow, each chapter is getting pretty long. So I, I saw my wife about it, and I thought, you know, the better way to do this is to make the case briefly in each chapter and then point people to the second half of the book where there's a secondary investigation where we can really look at the alternative explanations offered by Krauss and Hawking and, uh, you know, um, uh, Davies or Paul Davies or whoever it may be who's making an alternative of link and whoever it is who's making an alternative claim, and then try in our best effort to put it in lay language, you know, language that's accessible, why these things don't work. And what you have with uh, Lawrence Krauss, who uh, says that, hey, as long as you're willing to redefine what we mean by nothing, yeah. then you can get the universe from nothing. Mm -hmm. But that's the problem, is that, the, that the, the evidence we have scientifically tells us that the universe came from truly nothing. Nothing that's spatial, that's temporal, that is material. The stuff that we typically identify is the definition of naturalism, space, time, matter, the laws of physics and chemistry. These things do not exist in the environment. The environment's even a bad word to use because it's spatial, right? Yeah. But the point is, whatever it is that causes the universe cannot have any of those attributes. So what is it? You need a new definition of, of, of what, I guess, naturalism is, of what of what nothing is. And, okay, okay, but I tell you what, if you do that, you're going to end up with a definition that starts to make you sound like a theist. Because in the end, you need something to cause the universe to come into existence, and you cannot borrow, so you can't have a quantum environment in which there are multiple gen uh, universes emerging in some form of quantum physics, because you're having to borrow the elements that have not yet been created in order to talk about this process. So that's the problem, is he's got to redefine what nothing is. And, and that's one of the typical things we talk about in the book. Whenever you're working in a defense uh, attorney, there are one of three things they're going to do in order to try to defeat the prosecution's case. They're either going to try to redefine the law, redefine the issue at hand, or they're going to make some logical error that you have to expose, or they're simply going to make a claim that's not supported by evidence. Mm -hmm. And this is what we see happening on the other side. Even a claim about a multiverse generator is a claim you cannot make on the basis of any actual evidence. Yeah. This is a theory that you're testing, yet I'm not sure you could ever develop an evidential case for the multiverse. In fact, the kinds of things you might anticipate seeing as a result of expanding multiverses really aren't available to us. We don't see those things. So if anything, we're seeing just the opposite. But my point is, uh, you, you have to be able to make the case without, number one, redefining something out of the ordinary, or two, you have to have some evidence to support it with, and three, you can't make any logical errors. And that's what I keep on seeing the opposition uh, doing as they're trying to stay inside the room for an explanation. You know, when I think about a multiverse, I mean, I'm open to it, but I, I don't even see how that would even work as an argument against what we have in our universe. I, think, I mean, imagine in your days when you were regularly going out on a crime scene and you came across a scene where there's like a dead body in the middle of a street and you're trying to figure out what's going on, what happened, and someone comes and says, hey, I've, I've got the explanation, I figured it out. Oh, really? What happened? Oh, I'm not sure, but there's uh, another spot where there's 500 dead bodies over there, so we got it all taken care of. Because now all of a sudden you got, okay, now we got 501 dead bodies. I mean, how does it work to explain one universe to say, now we have many, many, many more universes? <laughs> Well, I think you're right about one thing, and, and this is something that uh, good philosophers have started talking about for a number of years, and that's that you, you really, if you push the fine-tuning, which is what you're trying to solve here, you're trying to solve the appearance of fine-tuning in the universe. And how do we solve this? It appears that the universe is amazingly fine-tuned for um, the existence of life. 
but 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 you know how do I how does this happen? Who, who could be the fine tuner? And so the one way to solve it is to say, well, gosh, if there are an, uh, an infinite number of universes being generated by a multiverse generator, a system, an environment of some type, well, then, of course, if you've got enough universes, one is likely to actually possess the properties that ours possesses. So the multiverse generator really becomes a way of, of solving a problem related to fine-tuning. As a matter of fact, that appears to be the, the essence of what is even driving this kind of theory. It's not that we have great evidence over here that we're seeing in the universe that inclines us to believe that there are a number of universes. It's no, we have a problem that we want to be able to solve naturally, and the only way we've been able to solve it naturally is to propose a theory, which is really not supported by the evidence right now, but it does solve a problem well, of course, you only have a problem because you're refusing the most reasonable inference to begin with, which is that there's a designer. And what you see is, is when you do that, and Richard Swinburne has been great. He's an Oxford philosopher and professor. And he says that, you know, any proposed multiverse mechanism needs to have a certain form rather than innumerable possible other forms and probably constants, too, that need fine-tuning in the narrow sense. In other words, in order for us to have this collection of universes in which one possesses life, there must be a multiverse mechanism that is itself fine-tuned in a narrow sense. So you just push the fine-tuning problem back one level to whatever it is that's producing all of these universes. So I don't think you've really solved the problem at all. And I'll, again, even if you thought you had, you've got no evidence that we can see in this room that points specifically to a multiverse generating device or mechanism outside the room. And not only that, think about this for a second, Nick. Mm -hmm. If there was a multiverse generator, okay, that, first of all, it creates all kinds of crazy problems philosophically, but let's just avoid those for a second. Even if there was a multiverse generator outside the room, that multiverse generator might give you um, a, a universe like ours in terms of its physical properties, but can it be the standard by which we measure anything that we call good or bad? Can it give us mind and free agency? Can it give us, in other words, this impersonal force of nature cannot give us all the things we see in our universe that are incredibly personal. If there's a personal force that causes the universe and it's creating in its image, well then we can account for the personal nature of consciousness and morality and our standard of good that we measure evil against and our free agency. Those very personal aspects, even the information that we see in the genetic code, which we know has to come from some kind of intelligent source, that multiverse generator won't get that for you. But if there is an intelligent cause outside of the universe that's personal, that could explain all that stuff. And that's why I think in the end, that the burden is on each of us. If that's what your multiverse generator is doing this, it has to also account for the origin of life, the appearance of design and biology, consciousness, free agency, morality, and the standard for evil. I don't think your multiverse generator can do that. Well, let's suppose that we've walked into the crime scene, as it were. What makes you think that there's not enough inside the room to explain? I mean, what are the clues that you're seeing and saying, okay, there's something else going on here? Well, I think part of it is that, you know, people will say, well, this isn't a God of the gaps deal. I mean, you, you basically, you've lined up eight pieces of evidence. You're trying to demonstrate that there's no uh, good explanation that we've yet uh, discovered inside the room. But all that really demonstrates is there's no good explanation that we've yet discovered. So because we don't have good explanations in these eight areas, you jump in that gap, you stick God. God is in the gap of our explanatory power in these eight areas. But that's not really what I'm doing, and here's why I say that. Every crime scene that you walk into, the evidence in the scene tells you something about the murderer before you ever even have a murderer identified. So, for example, if I walk into a death scene and it's a guy who's been shot in the back of the head um, uh, as he's standing at the register of his, of his business, that's one kind of killer. On the other hand, if it's if the same guy is not shot in the back of the head by the register, but in the back room where he's got a couch, he's been stabbed 70 times in the chest, that's a very different kind of killer. One might be a robber. The other one appears to have some reason to want to really hurt this guy. Very, very different kinds of killers, and I can determine the difference simply by looking at the evidence at the scene. Well, the same thing happens here.
Because as I look at the eight pieces of evidence, this is the beginning of the universe, the fine-tuning of the universe, the origin of life in the universe, the appearance of design and biology, the existence of consciousness, of free will, of transcendent moral truths, the presence of evil and injustice. Okay, I now know that whatever it is that causes these eight things to exist inside the room is, is going to have to have certain characteristics. It's going to have to be non-spatial, uh, temporal, non, uh, non-temporal, rather, uh, non-material. It has to be uncaused because it's the cause of everything we call space, time, and matter. It's going to have to be purposeful and kind of directed toward a goal which appears to be life. It's going to have to be intelligent and communicative to account for um, the DNA information we see in the origin of life. And it's got to be creative and resourceful because we see the way that there are design elements in the biological structures. It's going to have to be a conscious mind because it's going to make some choices to create and create creatures that possess this crazy thing called consciousness, especially when you consider how to get that in a material universe. It's going to have to be an agent that can freely choose between options because we see that in information. We also, in DNA, we also see that in different creative responses to how uh, uh, biological organisms are formed and shaped. It's going to have to be something that can be the source, the transcendent source of objective moral truth and something that's personal because we have not just objective moral truth, we have objective moral obligations and those only occur between persons. And finally, it's going to have to be the standard of good by which we would call something evil. Now, that's a very complex suspect profile. It describes a cause, a first cause, that has to be all of those things, the the non-spatial, non-temporal, non-material, personal kind of first cause that is a, a standard of moral good. Now, as I describe that suspect to you, it's pretty clear that whatever natural set of, of, of forces, whatever multiverse generator, whatever you think is out there that could cause one piece of that evidence, it can't account for all eight. Yet there does seem to be a suspect profile emerging before I ever even look. And by the way, Nick, this does not necessarily point distinctly to the Christian God. Right. It's the combination of, of, of God's crime scene and cold case Christianity. Those two investigations led me to choose Christianity as the truth. To, to actually know that that was true, so I, I think in the end, uh, it's not. It's, it's, it develops a suspect profile that, that inclines me to believe that the best explanation for this is something outside the room of the universe that is personal, and that's why I land, and that's why I first did, and that kind of to me knocked down a significant barrier I had to knock down before I could hear the gospel. Now I'm, I'll tell you this: I get a lot of grief, Nick, from people who don't like the kind of uh, strict uh, evidential approach that I take to apologetics. But, but for me, it was just a matter of having to knock down these barriers. I'm not stupid enough to suggest that I was capable on my own to make a decision as grand as this. As a matter of fact, I had such enmity toward God that I would never have even seriously considered the things of God at all. And it's because God did something first to remove my hostility that made any of this possible. But in the end, I do believe Christianity is a a worldview that encourages us to take a look at the evidence, because Jesus did that repeatedly, the gospel authors did that repeatedly, um, you know, uh, the, the letters of the new, uh, letter writers of the New Testament did that repeatedly. We are called to take a look. If you don't believe me, Jesus says, at least believe the evidence of these miracles I've worked in front of you. And so I, over and over again, I think we see that um, there's an evidential calling on us as Christians. Uh, and so that's, I took that advantage of that. I was actually encouraged by that when I first started looking at Christianity, that that Christianity was not something that asked me to believe blindly or to believe in spite of, of the evidence to the contrary, that instead um, it was, it was a, a belief system that encouraged me to look at the evidence, to measure that God for some reason would give me that opportunity. And as a result, that's why I think Christians could have a great deal of confidence about what they believe if they were willing to really look at the evidence. I, I think, yeah, the encounter a number of Christians like the ones that you're talking about and it's also too many atheists just as often expect too much from the arguments and one could put down your book and say well you know maybe Islam is true maybe Judaism is true maybe deism is true maybe Christianity is true all of those are still viable at the end of a book but you're not setting out to give <coughs> a one track argument that would prove 
that Christianity is true. And I remember my philosophy professor in seminary said, you know, you all should be thankful there isn't a philosophical argument for Christianity because you can't just sit down in your armchair and reason, hey, Jesus is Lord. You have to approach history to show God has acted in history to show Jesus is risen. Yeah, I think this is a couple step process for me, and, and in the end, I think what made that happen first is that um, God moved first, yeah. and uh, um, that really kind of opened up my um, desire to even to even look at this. I, I would have laughed at you if you had told me a year before I started looking at this. Um, if you had told me, Jim, next year you're going to look at this very seriously, I would have laughed at you. If you had said, next year, Jim, you're not even going to look at it seriously, you're going to end up deciding it's true. I would have, there's, my wife would tell you the same thing. No way. That is never going to happen. So why does it happen? Not on the strength of my own intellect. That's for darn sure. It happens on the strength of what God can do. But what, how does God do it? This evidence was a means to an end. And, and this is all it is. And, and so for me, it, it, you're talking to somebody who honestly did come to faith because this evidence knocked down all the objections I had, all the barriers I had. Because even when I got to the point, Nick, where at the end of reading the Gospels, and I did all the stuff I talk about in Cold Case Christianity, right? I did all that stuff. At the end of all that, um, I was like, okay, these are reliable to a point. But the supernatural stuff, that can't be true. That stuff can't be reliable because I, I reject miracles to begin with. And that's when I had to stop and say, okay, Jim, so why do I reject miracles? Well, because I have a philosophical foundation that is entirely natural. Okay, well, Jim, do you think that your philosophical naturalism can really account for the world the way it is? And if you, and that's, that's when I did the stuff that I'm talking about here in God's crime scene. So for me, it was cold case Christianity first. That brought me to a point where I said, okay, I'm close, but I, I, there's some stuff here I'll never accept. And then I had to go back and look, well, what's the greatest, if there is a God outside the universe, the greatest miracle he ever worked is not really in the pages of the New Testament. The greatest miracle he ever worked is in the pages of the Old Testament, it's Genesis 1. And if that kind of being exists, they can pull off Genesis 1. He can sure pull off, you know, um, you know John 14. So I think this is the, the whole point, is that the other miracles then came back into play for me once I truly examined my own uh, views as a naturalist. I'd like to remind everyone again that you're listening to the Deeper Waters podcast, and everything we do here is listener-supported. <clears throat> if you want to take a part of that, just go to deeperwaters.ddns.net and click the link to support the work of Deeper Waters Christian Ministries. Now, I'll take you to Risen Jesus. That's the ministry of my in-laws, Mike and Debbie Lacona. And if you go there, if you go in the right place, yes, there are ones who take donations for us. You make a donation, it's tax deductible, and you contact them and say, hey, I want to go to Nick Peters, I want to go to Deeper Waters, or you contact me and say that, and we'll make sure that donation comes through, and yes, it is tax deductible. And and even sweeter way you might want to do things with that now is you can make a donation directly to Risen Jesus. Now, here's the deal. Mike would very much like to take me online for a time with him as an, as a staff member at Risen Jesus. And my wife and I are really looking forward to this. We'd be moving to Atlanta then and living down there and doing more personal work with him. I'm talking about ideas like maybe forums, maybe videos, things of that sort to increase the reach of Risen Jesus and Deeper Waters would be partnering with him then. And also... Um, if you're worried the blog and podcast would stop, they've said very clearly, if you come work for us, you have to keep doing the blog and you have to keep doing the podcast. Like, oh, yeah, okay, I guess I have to suffer. But um, if you're interested in that, why should you do it now? Because up until the end of the month, December 31st of 2015, they have a matching grant set of $20,000. And people, if... They can receive that 20000 and get the matching grant. I am sure Allie and I would be well on our way to Atlanta, and we will greatly appreciate it. So until we end, you really consider making that donation and share this information with anyone you can. We really want to get out there and be doing this work. Now, you can also buy some of my books on Amazon, such as Defining Inerrancy or A Creed for the Ages. You know, I've got other ones. You just look my name and you find them. And then also... Uh, Christmas is coming up. Some of you might want to, some of you gentlemen especially, might want to get your ladies some piece of jewelry for Christmas. And, you know, if you're like me, you might want to pop the question around this time of year. I did it on Christmas Eve back in 
2009. And if you want to do that, why not do it through us? You go to our link page again, and there's a link to support us via purchasing jewelry. You click there, the access code is love. My friend Lena Clester handles everything. So you make a purchase of that nice engagement ring you want to give your lady or something of that sort. Purchase it like you always would. Just let her know. 25% of what you purchase goes to us. Now that means sounds like a good deal. You can get something really nice for a woman in your life and support a ministry at no extra charge. Now, uh, Jim, do you have any organization you'd like to see people support to or donate to? Well, you know, I just we just uh, today, you know, yesterday, actually signed uh, over 500 books for Stand a Reason. And so I would love people to go to str.org. That's an organization I started with when I first came out of law enforcement and was working as an apologist. We are you know, great friends, of course, and uh, we partner on tons of stuff. So, I mean, that, that, that those two ministries, uh, Stand to Reason at str.org and crossexamined.org uh, is uh, the two ministries that I probably work with the most. Mm-hmm. And this time of year, at the end of the year, as you know, Nick, this is the time when people can make those donations and kind of catch it. The, uh, underneath the IRS uh, guidelines, so if, if it's uh, out there, we you know you can go to str.org and you'll see that you can get a signed copy of the book uh, by simply donating this month to Stand a Reason. Yeah, Greg Kokor of Stand a Reason, great guy. He's been on my show before, and Frank Turek haven't got him yet, but he's a, he's a great guy just as much. So yes, I, I encourage that you go and support those ministries as well. Now, Jim, one objection some people might have to all this material you present is okay. You've got an interesting case here for a being you could call God, but, geez, you're trying to explain the universe, but what's your explanation of God? I mean, it's a classic question that usually gets asked. Well, if God created a universe, who created God? Right. I mean, this principle of causality that we kind of accepted and is really the foundation for all science does not say that everything has a cause. It says that everything that has a beginning, that's finite, that is limited, uh, those things have causes. And so if it's not any of those things, there's no point looking for a cause because the principle of causality does not apply to it. So we would say, well, God is in that category of not having a beginning. Therefore, it needs no beginner. The definition of God is that God is the uncreated creator of everything else. So to say, who created the uncreated creator is kind of a silly question. But let's just back it up for a second. Remember that everyone, both Christians and non-Christians, both theists and atheists, we all embrace an uncreated first cause of the universe. You don't think that Lawrence Krauss is looking, whatever that environment, whatever that thing is that he wants to call nothing, that is the cause of everything we see, that's an eternal kind of nothing. If it's a Valenka, these are eternal, uncreated uh, multiverse generators or quantum environments or whatever it is you're suggesting is out there, it has no beginning. So we're all in the same boat in this regard. We all embrace something with no beginning. The only question is, is the thing with no beginning personal or impersonal? We're back to that question again. So it's not as though the atheist is in any different position. I suggest that there is a, a better explanation outside the room of the universe that's a personal, uncaused first cause. My atheist friends suggest there's something outside the universe which is a impersonal, uncaused first cause. It turns out both of us embrace the uncaused part of this cause. So we're in the same boat. So that, that question could fairly be asked of either group. That's not going to get you off the hook. It's not as though I believe in something that's less reasonable than they do. We both believe in this thing. The question is simply, which is more reasonable, personal or impersonal? Mm-hmm. Now, that's bringing up another objection that you do cover in your book um, as well, and is a very important one. I mean, Jim, we live in a world where just last month we saw over 100 people murdered in Paris by ISIS, and we, many of us are living scared of ISIS right now, and you know, there are disasters like earthquakes, tornadoes, hurricanes, things sort that happen. Uh, Eva, doesn't that strike you as a powerful evidence that there isn't a really good and loving creator behind all of this? Yeah, and this is a tough question, right, in the sense that, that any, any um, objection related to the problem of evil, it's, it's, I can make the objection in, in 140 characters. I can make it in 30 seconds. So the answer in the question is uh, you can spend your entire life reading, just reading the books on theodicies that have been offered to answer this problem. I do know one thing. I know that in, in, in every case I've ever worked, when you're working in act of evil, which is typically what murders are, 
you're, you're working this case that is an act of evil, and it turns out that the explanation you offer in front of a jury is always going to be cumulative and complex. Mm -hmm. Cumulative and complex. So I don't suspect that the answer to this is going to be anything less or anything different. The problem of evil, in, broadly, is also cumulative and complex. And I think there are a number of reasonable explanations for why God, conditions that might exist, for why God would allow evil to occur. And I list seven of them in the book. But I don't think you could ever offer any one of them. When I get in front of a jury, I don't say, hey, I want you to believe he's the guy based on this one piece of evidence. No. I say, I want you to believe he's the, the correct suspect based on the 80 pieces of evidence I've given you that all point to the same reasonable inference. Same thing here. I, you can't go at this and say, well, you know, I, I've given you seven in the book that I think have to be uh, assessed cumulatively. Mm -hmm. So any act of evil, it's some relationship of these seven conditions and some are going to be in the forefront, some are going to be in the background, some are going to be connected and related to each other. It's going to be very messy. And in the mind of God, I'm sure it's clear. But I can tell you, I can't even, in my, my best efforts, get into the mind of my killers, let alone get into the mind of God to understand why any act of evil might have occurred. Mm -hmm. So I think that in the end, we have to be very uh, modest about how we approach this. But I do think it's going to be a cumulative case. And I think one of the things that, I often say is that the problem of evil is really more of a problem for the atheist than it is for the theist, and I'll say why I think that's the case. As an atheist, I believe that all of life was could be easily described as a line segment, a point of beginning birth, a point of ending death, and there's a 90 years in the middle that I hope to be completely pain-free. Uh, my, my, my goal is to make sure these are pain-free years in which um, you know I live without any uh, bump in the road. Now, that's how I saw life. If I got sick at 40 and suffered for 10 years and died at 50, I would have seen that as very evil because my expectation was 90 pain-free years. But what if my view of life, the condition I thought that was described life, is wrong? And instead of life being a line segment of 90 years, it's actually a ray that begins at birth, extends through death, off into the distance, infinitely, well, then we have to assess anything that happens in our life totally different because I'm not assessing it in the context of 90 years I expected. I've got to assess difficulties, pain, suffering, true evil in the context of eternity because that's what life is really all about. And I know that as a theist. I didn't have that view as an atheist, so I was mad if something happened. I want 90 pain for years, but now I realize that I don't think there are people who have been had operations in the first year of life that were horrific. And as a result of that operation, they suffered greatly. But if you ask them at the age of five, do they remember it? They're all like, no, I don't remember anything about it. Why? Because in the context of five years, they've now got the pain they suffered in the first year in its proper context. Mm -hmm. If life is eternal, I don't care what we suffer, if we suffered it every day for 90 years relative to eternity, our suffering would be a millisecond that would have passed in the blink of an eye. And now we can assess that evil in the proper context, given what we now know is true about the duration of life, as opposed to what we thought was true. So I think in the end, this is why Peter in First Peter says, talks about momentary affliction to a group that's been suffering for years. How could their year after year suffering be called momentary affliction by Peter because he mentions eternity in the very next line. He has an eternal perspective and that puts everything in its proper perspective. I think part of the problem is that many atheists and unfortunately many of us as Christians a lot of times often have this idea that it's sadly for Job theology in many cases and it was reviewed by God himself this idea that you know if I do such and such good X should happen. If I do bad yeah. X should happen back and then when we suffer we say hey God what's going on why aren't you doing anything I mean is, is this really part of a deal right but what if we said hey you know what uh, you've done this good thing and it has developed something in your character and there will be a good result that right. you have caused you've been involved in in some way but you may not see it in the 90 years you thought was life you may not see it until year 416 because it, it, life is not just the 90 years you thought it was so you keep on looking for, for results of your, your activity you know, uh, in this 90-year window when, in fact, you've got all of eternity to experience it. You don't know what you've done or didn't do that will cause something wonderful or despicable in eternity. But you'll know when you get there. 
Mm-hmm. And that's where we have to assess it. That's what we find ourselves, you know, uh, as infants, uh, 18 months old, trying our desperately to understand what life is like in middle age. But of course, we can't do it because we don't have that perspective yet. Mm-hmm. And, and this is what we find ourselves doing, even as old men and old women, you know, at 90 years old, we are trying to assess what, what really is eternity in just the brief context of 90 years. It's kind of tough. Yeah, and I mean, one brief example I'd use, and we're going to be wrapping this up soon, is that when people ask me, what was life really like before you got married? I can't really remember too much. I mean, I remember some of the things I did, but my life on a day-to-day basis, not really. It's totally different now. And for you, it's probably even more totally different because it was so much longer for you. Yeah, I mean, we were together for 18 years before we got saved, and we've been together for 18 years since we got saved. Wonderful. So we've been together for 36 years, and, you know, the 18 years before is like a whole different life. And there are many things that stand out in that period of time. But but there's, you know, we've kind of seen now that, that we weren't really living the way we're living now. And I can tell you it's a lot harder now on this side of being a Christian because we're called to do the things that aren't popular, that aren't necessarily convenient, to do the right thing and to deny ourselves, to deny our base desires. Who likes to do that? No one likes to do that. So, so I think that in the end, it's a much harder way to live. But um, you, you have more a proper perspective on how things connect. Mm-hmm. And that, that's always better, I think, in the end. So, so if there is no purpose, if Dawkins is right, and there's no purpose to anything, and everything is just chaos, colliding against chaos, and sorry, that's just the way it is, some people are going to get run over, well, then there really isn't much reason to try to connect the dots. Mm-hmm. There isn't much reason to try to make sense out of it. You're really just fooling yourself. You're, you're, you're creating a false fiction to kind of make yourself feel better. On the other hand, if it, is, if it is a caused universe by a creator who has a purpose for us, even though that purpose may not be visible to us until many years after we're dead, uh, we, we could, I think, then begin to try to understand what that, it makes sense, as a matter of fact, to begin to understand and search for and think through what that purpose might be. It makes no sense to do that if there isn't, if life is just 90 years of chaos and nothing really matters. The book is God's Crime Scene, looking right now on Amazon. It's available in paperback for 10.43 and on Kindle for 9.91. Uh, Jim, it's been great having you on. If people want to find out more about you and what you're doing, do you have a blog or a website where they can get in touch with you? Yeah, I write every day. I post a video once a week and a podcast once a week at coldcasechristianity.com. So please get over there and uh, join us. You'll see we're blogging about the stuff in the book for the last couple of months, and uh, we're always doing something either related to the case for theism or the case for Christianity. And do you have uh, any uh, final words you'd like to have today for the Deeper Waters audience? Yeah, this, the, the, the real, reality for all of us is we have to get in the game. And so sometimes we're either on one side or the other of this issue. We're either apologetics consumers or we're apologetics creators. We're either listening to somebody else make the argument or make the case, or we're actually involved making the case ourselves. We don't have to have a blog or have a website to get in the game, but we have to move and shift from consumers to creators, to content providers. And sometimes it's just as simple as, making the case to the people that matter the most to us. If it's at work, if it's at school, if it's in your own family context, the minute you start making the case, you've shifted from consumption to creation. And I think that's what we need to do if we want to have an impact on the culture. Well, Jim, I'd like to thank you for coming on the show, and I hope we'll see you back here again sometime. I'm sure. I'm glad to come back any time. Just ask me, and I'll be here. Well, I can remind everyone about this Saturday. We're going to have Craig Keener come on talking about the Book of Acts. Like I said, he's written you know, a, a vision a little bit on that book. <laughs> well, now, I'm Nick Peters, and I am signing off. <laughs>